Teacher's Ghost by Nakamura Hiroshi Spring vacation ended and a new term was beginning. The outside walls of the school, along with the halls and classrooms, had been given a shiny new coat of paint. Wow, it's so nice. It's like a new school. I love it. Yeah, apparently we're getting a new teacher as well. The children were very excited. They were about to enter the rainy season, and gloomy weather persisted day after day. Huh? Miss, that white wall over there. There's something black on it. Oh, so there is. Maybe it's mold. I'll bring some cleaner tomorrow and try to get it off. The next day, the teacher tried wiping the black spot off. But no matter what she did, it wouldn't come off. On the contrary, that thing that looked like a stain was getting even bigger. It's kind of dirty, huh? I'll ask them to paint over it again, she said. She put in a request, and the usually ambivalent principal quickly went to see the janitor. The wall was immediately painted white again. The children noticed it the next morning as they arrived at school. Ah, it's been painted. Yeah, it has. It's like a new classroom. It's not dry yet, so don't touch it. We don't want to mess it up again. After that, three months passed. It was September. The second school term was starting. You might call it the long rainy spell of autumn, but one unsettled morning. It's awful! It's awful! The children went running to the teacher's room. When we went into the classroom this morning, the black spot was back in the same area as before. It looks like somebody's shadow. Miss, maybe it's a girl. It looks like it might be bleeding as well. When the teachers and principal heard of this, they ran to the classroom. The moment they looked at the wall, they screamed. It was just like the children said. The janitor brought some paint and quickly painted over the top of the black spot. It was like new again. But just what was that spot? The old janitor, who had been at the school for a long time, told them the following story. It must have been more than 30 years ago. There was a young female teacher. The school was still made of wood and different to the current one. But the room that we just painted was her classroom. Next to that was the science and preparation rooms. When they had meetings amongst the same grade, they had to pass the west entrance if they wanted to speak to the teachers from the other classes. She was a very dedicated teacher, and she would sit in the classroom late into the night, researching and preparing for the next day. On this day, she was again in the class late at night, with the lights on. At the time, there was a person on night duty. It was rather late, so he approached the teacher and said, Ma'am, the trains to get home are going to stop soon. When he opened the door, he was shocked. At the time, I lived in the school grounds and he rushed to get me. When I went, the classroom was covered in blood and the teacher was on the ground. She was ill. She had thrown up blood and, looking for help, she must have walked along the wall, 
leaving it covered in blood. The teacher was hospitalized, and a short while later, she died. They cleaned the classroom like new, but they didn't use it again. After that, the wooden school was quickly knocked down, and the current steel one was built. That black shadow. I can't help but think that it looks like that teacher. Kucha Kucha Hara Hara by Sakurai Nobuo. This happened a while ago now. It was shortly after I started work as a junior high teacher. At the time, there was a janitor who stayed overnight at the school, but the teachers also took turns performing night duty. They said it was to make sure no thieves entered, and we only patrolled at night. I was still single at the time. So teachers with families often asked me to take their place. Sure, that's fine, I always said without a care. And so the number of times I performed night duties increased. I got paid for it, so it was like a part-time job. And it wasn't like anything serious ever happened. Then one night, while I was on duty, there was a hall. That led from the school building to a separate building, where the janitors and night duty rooms were housed. After I was done eating a simple dinner in the night duty room, I started my first patrol at around 7 p.m. The school building was shaped like an L, with stairs in the middle. It was a two-story wooden building, and going from the stairs in the middle, we called the east side the east building. And the west side, the west building. The hall leading from the night watch room went beneath the center stairs and towards the entrance. After checking the the front door was locked, I had to go to the end of the first floor of the west building, and then check the door there was locked as well. Then I had to go up to the second floor, follow the hall down to the end of the east building, then back down the stairs. Check the entrance again, and then back to the middle. With my light, I checked the windows and classrooms. The building was wooden, so it often creaked as I walked. Of course, nothing ever happened. I went back to the night duty room and marked homework to pass the time. After 11 p.m., I started my second round. I followed my usual path up to the middle of the second floor, and glanced over at the east building. Huh? What's that? I muttered without thinking. At the end of the hall was a flickering flame, roaring to life. I strained to look closer. No doubt about it, something was on fire. Fire! I grabbed the extinguisher from the nearby wall and ran at full speed towards it. But when I got there, neither the classrooms nor the end of the hall, not anything, was on fire. I put the extinguisher back, returned to the center, and then looked over at the west hallway. A small flame roared to life. It looked like the light from a cigarette. Again, I grabbed the extinguisher and ran over. But when I got there, there were no signs of any fire. There was nothing but silence. I trembled. It was like I could hear my own heart, and chills ran down my spine. I put the extinguisher back and finished my rounds. The lights were off in the janitor's room by the night duty room, and the janitor appeared to be fast asleep. I couldn't wake him up just to tell him about the strange occurrences that had just happened. I went back to the night duty room, turned the lights on, sat down, and stared into space. Next thing I knew, 
the alarm clock was going off. It was two in the morning, and time for my next patrol. Clenching my stomach and swinging my arms and legs, I went through my usual rounds. Nothing happened. Relieved, I made my way down the final hall towards the janitor's room. And although the lights were off, I could hear something inside. Surprised, I stopped before the door. Pecha pecha, pecha pecha. That's what it sounded like. Like when a dog drinks water, or when a person slurps when they're focused on eating something. I held my breath and pressed my ear against the door. Kucha kucha, hada hada. It definitely sounded like he was trying to breathe while stuffing his mouth with something. What on earth was the janitor eating in the darkness to make a sound like that? As though that strange sound was drawing me closer, I whispered, Mister! Hey, Mister! Then the sound suddenly stopped. There was no response. <laughs> I thought that perhaps he'd been caught red-handed eating his favourite food and he didn't want anyone to see him. Well, whatever. I figured I'd leave him be and started walking away quietly when... Pecha pecha. Pecha pecha. The sound started again. It was followed by kucha kucha. Hada hada. The sound brought up a fear deep within me. Perhaps it was some monster I'd never seen before eating the janitor. I ran into the night duty room. If it really was a monster, what could I do? No, monsters were foolish, imaginary things. At a loss for what to do, I didn't get a wink of sleep until the sun rose. When it was bright outside, I left the room. The janitor's door was open, but nobody was inside. I peeked in to see if there was any blood on the floor, but it looked the same as always. I went to the toilets to wash my tired face. The grey speckled janitor was there, brushing his teeth. I skipped right over the morning greetings. Did you sleep well last night, or...? The janitor rinsed his mouth and turned to stare at me. I continued with my questions. What were you eating last night, around 3am? Ah, so you heard it too, huh? It. You mean the pecha pecha, kucha kucha, hada hada. That's it. I heard it while I was in bed last night too. Oh really? I called out to you at that time though. Ah, I didn't hear anything. The janitor shook his head. If that sound wasn't you, then what on earth was it? I asked, short of breath. The janitor answered quietly and slowly. Apparently, the janitor before the last one died suddenly in the corner of that room. They say he ate too many tomatoes. Or perhaps it was some other illness, but when he was eating the tomatoes, he died. There was little food after the war, but he was probably especially fond of tomatoes. I heard his eyes changed colour when it came to tomatoes. Anyway, every now and then, they could hear what sounded like him gobbling away at his tomatoes. Right around now is tomato season, after all. I felt bad for the janitor who died so suddenly, and I guessed the mysterious fires in the school and the slurping must have been him. He was still lingering around the school.
Death Notice by Mochizuki Shinsaburo. The school I'm at now has hired most of its security out to a professional company, and the teachers no longer have to go on night watch or be on the lookout for fires. But until that time, most teachers had to do it. Well then, let me tell you a scary story about a real experience I had while I was on night watch. It was the spring of 1961. I taught math at U High School in M Prefecture. I was in charge of class 3B. A new semester had started, the snow had melted, and the plums had just started to bloom. It was my turn for night watch. On this particular day, it was past five in the evening. I made my way from the management office towards the classrooms in the main school building. And as I passed through the hall, I started checking all the rooms. I was right around the middle of the hall when the class I was in charge of, 3B, came into view. I glanced at the room, not a care in the world, when suddenly I couldn't believe my eyes. It appeared that someone was in the room. Hmm? That's odd. All of the students should have gone home by now. Looking closer, a single student was sitting alone. Their posture was straight and upright like they were waiting for something. They looked just like a doll, and the room was so quiet. I went towards the window and took another look. Ah, Ishii. Judging by the seat, it was Ishii Deiko. Her family owned a timber shop. I wondered if she was just taking a break. Anyway, I need to send her home. I should call out to her. I hurried around to the back of the classroom and yanked on the door. It was shut tight and wouldn't budge. That's strange. It should be open. I went to the front instead and tried that door. But again, no matter how much I pulled, it wouldn't budge. What else could I do? I banged on the window glass and yelled, Hey, is she? But she didn't turn around. She continued sitting there in complete silence. Even I, the type of person who was always cheerful, started to feel uneasy. But I couldn't just leave her there. I went around to the back door once more and again tried pulling on it. This time, it opened quickly. As I stepped inside, a chill ran over me. Reiko, who had just been sitting there, was now gone. No matter how you looked at it, she couldn't have gone out the front door. She disappeared. In the morning, we received a message from Ishii Reiko's family. Last night, Reiko was found dead in Lake Akan in Hokkaido. It appears that she drowned. It was thought that the time she died was right around the time I passed the classroom and saw her inside. She came to see me. I remembered back to a snowy day in March. In the afternoon, it began snowing. And then it changed into a wet snow. I went to the school gate and noticed a single female student walking by without an umbrella. I ran over to her to let her share mine. Here, stand under mine. That student was Ishideko, the eldest daughter of the timber shop near my apartment. Her face seemed somewhat pale and lifeless. 
I wonder if something's bothering her. My teacher's intuition went off. I walked her to her house and then said to her, Listen, if there's anything troubling you or you're having a tough time with something, you can come and talk to me anytime. Just like math, but by adding and subtracting things, eventually we'll get to the answer. Neko bowed, smiled sadly, and went inside. A short while later, Neko called my apartment, but unfortunately I was out, and my wife took the call. Concerned, I went to school, but the next day she was absent. Apparently, she'd run away from home. Ah, Neko wanted to talk to me about something. Neko, why were you in such a rush to die? Even now, I still think about it. Rattle Rattle by Shibuya Isao This elementary school was on top of a small hill outside the city. The rear of the school was lined with a deep green cedar forest that was planted several decades earlier. One April, a young male teacher who had just freshly graduated from university started work there. He was in charge of the third grade. It happened around this time, when he still hadn't yet learnt all of his students' names. On this particular day, he was on his first day duty since starting work. It had been drizzling since morning, and although it was April, it was cold enough that people still wanted the heater on. The teacher on day duty used to stay in the school overnight in the night duty room and patrol the school, but now we have a security guard that does that, so you don't need to stay. It's easy now. Another teacher, who was close to retirement, told him and the day passed without event. Still, until the security guard arrived that night at 8pm, he had to stay behind at school. See ya! See ya tomorrow! Other teachers started returning home after six in ones and twos, and when he was the last one left, he started eating ramen as darkness fell outside. He would have to patrol the school himself at least once before the guard got there. He cleaned up in the security room's kitchen, grabbed the torch, and decided to look around the three buildings that made up the school. After leaving the teacher's room, he suddenly remembered something and ran back. Oh yeah, the wooden sword, the wooden sword. A wooden sword sat in the corner of the locker in the teacher's room, just in case of emergencies. Holding it in hand, the teacher felt somewhat safer. He gripped the sword in his right hand and the torch in the left, and softly exhaling, he left the room. Creak, 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 creak. His leather sandals echoed strangely down the hall. As he walked around alone, the building completely silent, it was like the children running around and making noise during the day was nothing but a dream. Creak, 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 creak. As the light of the teacher's room got further away, chills ran down his spine. The light of the torch swayed before his feet, and his sweaty hand gripped the sword. His patrol involved checking the halls, and that each of the classroom windows were shut correctly. First, he checked the two-story building with the teacher's room, lunchroom, music room, and other special classrooms. Then, 
He checked the three-floor building that housed the first to third grade. He shone the torch down the hall and through the window glass. Numerous times he stopped at what he thought was the figure of somebody hiding in a room, or a shadow rising from nothing. Rain continued to fall outside. Perhaps thanks to that, the classrooms and halls stank of sweat and mould. Finally, he checked the building that housed the fourth to sixth grade. Last one. He took a breath, walked down the hall, checked the first floor, then went to go up to the second. Creak, 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 creak. He heard footsteps, but this time they weren't his own. Shocked, he stood still and listened closer. Creak, 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 creak. Someone was definitely coming up the stairs. He gulped and slowly turned around. The torchlight dimly shone on the landing of the stairs. Nobody was there. He went upstairs and down the second floor hall when he heard footsteps behind him again. His body went stiff and his throat dried up. He swung the sword in front of him and purposefully walked loudly enough for others to hear him. There were five rooms in a row for the fifth grade. Their school only had four classes, however, so the last room wasn't in use. He went inside each room and painstakingly checked each window. As he stood before the final, empty room, he suddenly thought, I wonder if I should check this one as well. It wasn't normally in use, so none of the windows should have been open. But still, he was concerned. So, he opened the door with a rattle and shone his light inside, taking a peek. Chairs sat piled in the back of the room, and the room stank of dust. Ah! The teacher suddenly screamed. The window at the front of the room was open. What the? Who did this? Muttering, he stepped inside and went to close the window. Rattle, rattle. Rattle, rattle. He heard what sounded like a pulley. (gasps) His heart thumped wildly, and it felt like something cold ran down the length of his spine. The hand gripping the sword began to sweat as well. He shone the torchlight on the dark window. Then, from the back of the room, he heard a loud crash near the piled up desks and chairs. Who's there? He jumped and spun around. He shone his torch towards the back of the room. A lone black cat swiftly ran through his legs. His knees trembled. Holding his breath, the teacher ran towards the window and closed it with trembling hands before locking it. Then, once again, rattle, 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 rattle. Rattle, rattle. He heard what sounded like a pulley. The sound grew larger, perhaps thanks to the wind, and then smaller, but he had most definitely heard it. (gasps) Then he suddenly felt a warm breath on the back of his neck. His mind went black, and he fainted on the spot. When he finally woke up, he was in the hospital. The teacher he spoke to earlier was there to see him. I see. So it appeared, huh? He grinned and nodded. 
A while back, when the school was just built, there was apparently an old temple. The cedar forest area was a graveyard. No, even now there are still old tombstones in there. Then, by the entrance, there was this old well, with a pulley. It was a place to collect water for those visiting the graves. You pour water over the tombstones when you visit, right? Of course, even though the tombstones are still there, there's nobody left to tend to them. On rainy nights, you can hear the rattling of that pulley in the well, like someone's playing a prank. The teacher smiled again. But, you're the first who's ever actually run into a ghost. With that, he patted him on the shoulder, and then left the room. The Ghost That Came to See the Teacher by Ozawa Kiyoko This happened around the start of the Showa era. Something terrible happened at a high school in M City, Nagano Prefecture. A student killed themselves. He drank poison up in the mountains near the school, cut his wrists, and then died. His name was Yamada, a third grader. He left no suicide note, and neither his friends nor his family had any idea why he would kill himself. Several days before he killed himself, the student skipped school. He'd never missed a day of school without contacting them before. His homeroom teacher, Mr. Kawakami, thought, perhaps I should go visit his house. But he was bogged down in test preparations and staff meetings and never got around to it. Then, the boy committed suicide. If I had just spoken to him when he missed school, then perhaps I could have been some help, the teacher thought regretfully. About a month later, Mr. Kawakami's turn for night duty rolled around. Around midnight, he was asleep in the night duty room, when suddenly his chest felt heavy and his eyes flung open. The moment he opened them, he screamed. A translucent, pale face stood right before his eyes. It was Yamada, the student who killed himself. The dead Yamada sat upon his teacher's chest, looking down at him. Wah! Ya Yamada! The teacher tried to jump to his feet, but his arms and legs wouldn't move. It was as though a large rock had been placed on his chest. Uh, uh. His entire body screamed as he struggled. Then, Yamada disappeared, and his body suddenly grew lighter. Covered in a clammy sweat and short of breath, the teacher was no longer able to sleep. Trembling in fear, he waited for morning to break. The next morning, the principal listened as Mr. Kawakami told him his story. Perhaps you just dreamt of this ghost, he said. He didn't believe him at all. But not just the principal. The other teachers also said to him, You're thinking about him too much, so that's why you had a nightmare. Then they laughed. At first, he was convinced it wasn't a dream. But as the days passed, he began to think. Perhaps it really was a dream. Besides, none of the other teachers experienced the same thing when they were on night duty. Before long, it was Mr. Kawakami's turn for night duty again. Not again. What am I gonna do? He didn't want to do it again, 
not after last time. But nobody believed his story about the ghost, so there was no way he could refuse it. After thinking on it for a while, he decided that he would ask someone else to do it with him. He asked the janitor whether he would stay overnight with him. He told him the exact reason why. Sure, I can do that. I drink so much I never dream anyway. The old guy happily agreed. That night, Mr. Kawakami and the janitor drank and went to sleep. He hoped that he would be able to sleep soundly, without any strange dreams. How long did they sleep, I wonder? Mr. Kawakami's chest felt heavy, and he woke up. Something painfully pushed down on his chest in the narrow space he was sleeping in. <coughs> Yamada was sitting on his chest again. His eyes glistened in his pale face. He tried to get up, but he couldn't. It was like he was bound by rope, unable to move. Help me. He tried to speak, but deep in his throat, the only sound he made was like that of a flute. Then, the sleeping janitor next to him woke up. The old guy saw it too. The dead student on the teacher's chest. Uh, uh, help me. The old guy jumped out of bed. He tried to grab the student, but he fell over limply on his backside. It was terrifying. It was the first time in my life I'd ever seen anything so terrifying. The janitor said the next morning, the lack of sleep evident on his pale face. Seems he was telling the truth, the other teachers said. Well, they do say that someone's spirit lingers on Earth for 49 days after they die, they whispered reluctantly. Then, three days later, in the library, the teacher in charge of putting books away was on the second floor. It was around 9pm. Something creaked in the hall, like somebody walking down it. All of the students should have gone home by now. She stepped outside. Nobody was there. Moonlight filtered in through the windows. Creak. Creak. This time, the sound was going down the stairs. The teacher rushed over to the top. A single student holding some books was walking down them in the darkness. The library is only open until five, so what on earth have they been doing all this time? She got upset and screamed. Who's there? The student stopped and turned around. Ah. Oh. The teacher's breath caught in her throat. Beneath the dim lights, a pale face looked at her. It was Yamada, the student who committed suicide. Even though I couldn't see his legs, I could still hear the sound of his footsteps. Then he disappeared on the spot. It was definitely that kid who killed himself, Yamada. The teacher said, trembling. By now, more than three people had seen Yamada's ghost, which meant it was impossible for the principal to ignore any longer. I'll think about what to do regarding night duty, he promised Mr. Kawakami. They spoke to the local government office and did all they could to make sure that Mr. Kawakami would never have to work night duty again. You have received special exemption from night duty. 
Mr. Kawakami was soon informed by M. Sidi. And perhaps, thanks to that, Yamada's ghost was never seen again. I Want to Be Number One by Mizutani Shozo. Whenever students took tests at this particular junior high, it was a custom to post the results on the walls of the gym, starting from the best and going down to the worst. The stunned students who found themselves in the bottom half of the rankings would side-eye them, as though they actually belonged to someone else, while the usual top five had slaved away for their positions. At the time, the first and second positions were taken by students by the names of Uchida and Kawaii. Uchida, in particular, seemed to bet his entire existence on getting top marks on those tests. He was of a sickly appearance, suffering from asthma, and yet, as tests approached, he seemed to forgo all sleep in order to study. During the first semester of second grade, however, Uchida fell to third. He was also in third for midterms. He panicked. Starting that day, if he had a spare moment, he'd be glued to his notes and textbooks, barely raising his face. He was extremely focused in class, so much that people held back from approaching him. One day, the teacher Mr. Kudo grew worried, and tapping him on the shoulder, said, Uchida, you're working too hard. Overworking yourself won't get you anywhere. Uchida coughed two, three times, but he didn't look up. Around the end of term tests, Uchida missed school. He was having an asthma attack. He missed several days, and his mother called the school, explaining that even though he was at home, he couldn't stop thinking about the tests. Then, one cold November morning, Uchida suddenly died. I warned him several times not to overdo it, and yet, his mother said to Mr. Kudo with tears in her eyes. The end of term tests were over. When marking was done, a large sheet of paper was hung in the gym as usual. All right, let's go home, Mr. Kudo said to himself and started cleaning up his desk. It was already dark outside. The only other person in the staff room was Mrs. Shimizu. Of course, all of the students had already gone home. Oh, Mr. Kudo, she cried. The lights are on in the gym. Maybe someone forgot to turn them off. No, I turned them off. I remember. Mr. Kudo didn't really believe her and calmly walked down the dark hall towards the gym. Light filtered out through a small gap in the door. It sounded like somebody was coughing inside. Hmm? Is someone in there? Who could it be at this time of night? Mr. Kudo flung the door open. A heavy sound echoed throughout the room. Nobody was there. Of course there's no one here. I'm just hearing things, Mr. Kudo thought, flicking the light switch off and then closing the door. When he returned to the staff room, Mrs. Shimizu stood frozen by the window, looking outside. What's wrong? They're on again. Eh? Mr. Kudo couldn't believe his eyes. The lights really were on in the gym across the school grounds. That's strange. I turned them off. Maybe the switch is broken. 
Maybe. I don't like it. Mr. Kudo was annoyed and left for the gym again. He reached for the door when he heard it again. The soft coughing inside. Frightened, Mr. Kudo's breath caught in his throat. It couldn't be, he thought. He was frozen to the spot. His heart felt like it would burst from his chest. His ears rang, and his armpits broke out into a cold sweat. Then, the sound on the other side of the door stopped. Gathering himself, the teacher peeked through a gap in the door. He couldn't see any signs of anyone inside. The gym was brightly lit. He pushed the rumbling door open. It echoed throughout the school. Of course, nobody was there. Mr. Kudo glanced over at the grades on the wall, and all of the energy drained from his body. First place had been smeared with blood. New Year's had passed, and the third term just started. It was five in the morning on January 9th. Masayoshi-kun, who went to a school for the handicapped, tossed two, three times in his bed, and then screamed in a loud voice, The teacher is here! He then clung to his sleeping mother next to him. She quickly grasped his right hand. He spoke so fast that she couldn't hear what he said clearly, so she asked him, Masayoshi, what's wrong? Where does it hurt? She turned to look at the clock, as was her usual habit. It said 5.13. Masayoshi-kun jumped out of the bed, and his voice turned sharp. The teacher has come to school, he repeated. Masayoshi, by teacher, do you mean Mr. Shimomura? He's in the hospital. Yeah, Mr. Shimomura. Breaking out into a smile, his mother patted his head. That's right, that's right. You had a dream that Mr. Shimomura came to school. Mr. Shimomura was very kind. He always chatted and was good at singing. The children loved him. That morning, Masayoshi got in the car, as always, and his mother drove him to school. When they got there, they found out that the second grade teacher, Shimomura Yuji, had died at M Medical Hospital. The time of death was 5.13 a.m. The cause of death was leukemia. Masayoshi-kun's mother was shocked. She remembered him repeating over and over that the teacher had come to school, and she told this to the principal. Hearing this, Kikue-san's mother was also shocked. Please look at this photo. Eh? This is from when they visited the zoo last autumn, right? Yes, Kikue brought it to me this morning. She kept pointing to Mr. Shimamura over and over. Well... It turned out that six different children had each informed their parents of Mr. Shimamura in their own way. Just how much did he want to get back to school? He must have wanted to see the children again. Somehow, he was able to get through to them and let them know. He really was a great teacher who loved his kids, huh? Red High Heels by Watanabe Setsuko when Miss Yoshida returned to the school, everything was dark. The reason for this late time was because of Miss Mariko's wake. Miss Yoshida and Miss Mariko 
were very extremely close friends. After all, they were both fresh recruits who had only started work at the school that spring. Mariko loved both books and children, and she was most fond of interesting stationery. That was why she decided at a young age to become a teacher. Then, she finally did become a teacher. She was so happy. On the day of the opening ceremony, she wore her favorite red high heels and celebrated all by herself. Memories flashed through Miss Yoshida's mind as she went to the sixth floor to gather her things, and then she got on the elevator to return to the first floor. She'd forgotten some of her stuff upstairs. Miss Mariko lived every day to the fullest after becoming a teacher. She worked so hard that she tired herself out. That must have been why, on the previous morning, she dashed out because of her exhaustion. In a daze, she made her way towards school, all the way to the crossing before the front gate. Without a thought, she stepped out onto the road without looking at the lights, and a car went hurtling towards her at full speed. She died instantly. Everyone rushed over in a panic. And Mariko's eyes were wide open as she rolled down the street. The expression on her face seemed to say that she had no idea what was going on. The fifth floor. Fourth floor. The elevator suddenly stopped. Huh? Is someone getting on? But it's Saturday. There shouldn't be any students here at this time. Feeling something was off, the door slowly opened. All she could see on the other side was a dark hall spread out before her. There's not even anyone here. Unnerved, she went to press the close button when she heard a woman's cheerful voice coming from somewhere. Sorry. Could you hold it open for me? So someone really was there. Maybe a student forgot something, she thought, relieved. Something clanked down the other end of the hall, like the sound of shoes. Not a student's shoes, but adult shoes. The sound of high heels. Clank, clank, clank. The heels got closer, but she couldn't see anyone. She broke out in goosebumps, and looking closer, she noticed two red things on the floor in the darkness. Red high heels. The red high heels clanked towards the elevator. They were coming towards her. They reached the elevator and stopped in front of it. Bright red high heels. Shoes that she knew. They were Mariko's. No mistake. Both shoes stopped just slightly apart. Ah, she realized they were going to get on. Miss Yoshida suddenly pressed the close button. The doors slowly moved, and the moment the right heel moved slowly through the air, the door closed. Ah! She heard a voice on the other side of the door. Miss Yoshida continued pressing the close button and that for the first floor. The third floor. Second floor. First floor. She removed her trembling finger from the close button, and the doors slid open. The other side was empty. After confirming nobody was there, Ms. Yoshida stepped out. Kang 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 kang. A sound hurried towards her from the stairs. The shoes are coming. Mariko is coming. 
She's coming after me. She took off running, and after that was a blur. But for the next few days, she couldn't find it in herself to go to school. Mariko probably doesn't realize that she's dead yet, because it was so sudden. That's why she's still here, at her beloved school. That was what Miss Yoshida believed. The teacher who disappeared in the toilet. Roughly a two hour train ride from Tokyo, there was a small castle town. In the castle remains in the middle of the city, you could find what was left of a castle tower, a moat filled to the brim with water, and a wooden otemon gate. In the outermost region of this castle, there used to be an elementary school made of wood, surrounded by cherry blossoms and zelkova trees. This happened five or six years ago. A new male teacher moved to the school. He had somewhat of a stoop and was a man of few words, already in his forties. He was in charge of class 5-3. For his introduction, he said, I was born in a small castle town in the Tohoku region. This town very much reminds me of where I was born. It really takes me back. He then turned around to the blackboard. My name is Yamagami Toemon. Sounds like a samurai name, right? He puckered his lips and laughed. The children laughed in return. Although he was a little clumsy and unreliable, he often played dodgeball in other games with the children during recess and after school, so he was rather popular. As the May holidays came to an end, the class went on a trip. Every year, the fifth grade visited the nearby Mount Mitsumine. They would climb this 900 meter mountain on foot without any help. They had to walk along the ridge, so it was terribly difficult. 7 a.m. The first three fifth grade classes, along with their teachers and the school nurse, lined up in front of the school gate. Everyone was excited, and there were roughly 100 people in total. They walked 30 minutes to the foot of the mountain. They could no longer see any houses, and they started their climb. They crossed over a timber bridge. Then, once they passed the cedar plantation, the road up became even more difficult. Listen carefully. Even if you're thirsty, you mustn't drink too much water. Mr. Yamagami mumbled to the children of Class 3 as they walked. Birds sang between the trees, and a refreshing breeze wicked away the children's sweat. There's a small open space just up ahead, so we'll take a break once we reach it. Mr. Yamagami pointed up the mountain. Sir, have you been here before? Yes, this is my fifth or sixth time. Hey. What did you come here for? The children grew interested. I love castles, you see. The area just up there is the remains of a former branch castle. Yeah, we know. We visited it in the third grade. It's where the castle princess died, right? Long ago, during the Sengoku period, a princess escaped up there after her castle was conquered. People said she then committed suicide. It was a place with a terribly sad story. And this all happened about 500 years ago, the teacher said, as though convincing himself, his voice full of remorse. They soon reached a flat, open area with a beautiful view. A small break, the vice principal walking at the head of the line screamed. The area was like a small park. They could see the houses and the castle town in the distance. To the north was a small old wooden toilet. Children lined up to go to the toilet, have a drink, eat chocolate, etc. And for a moment, the open area sprang to life. Yet, when it was time to leave, nobody could find Mr. Yamagami. Where's Mr. Yamagami? 
The children from class three ran around looking for him. He's in the toilet, one boy said, pointing towards it. I saw him. Then I'll go call him. A group of five or six boys approached the toilets. They were split into boys and girls, and inside the boys' side were five stalls. Sir? Mr. Yamagami? It's time to go. They called out and knocked on each of the doors in turn, but there was no response. They then tried opening the doors, but there was nobody inside. Maybe he's in the girls' toilets. No way, he's a man. Confused, the children went over to the girls' toilets, yet he wasn't there either. What's wrong? Did something happen? The vice principal asked the boys. We can't find Mr. Yamagami. Mr. Yamagami? Yeah, he was supposed to be in the toilets, but... After hearing their explanation, the vice principal went into the toilets and knocked on all the stalls. Ah, uh, it's time to go. Suddenly they heard Mr. Yamagami's voice. The children all looked at each other. Oh my, he's right here. The vice principal ruffled their hair. Well, let's go. They walked back over to the children lining up and got in line. Ah, I'm sorry. The toilet door opened, and Mr. Yamagami left, smiling. Sir, were you in there the whole time? Huh? Why? For a moment he looked at the children, confused. Ah, I stayed up late last night researching something. I slept in late this morning, so I didn't have time to go to the toilet. Yeah. The whistle signifying it was time to leave went off. Well, let's hurry along now. Fastening his belt and almost dragging his legs along, the teacher rushed over to the others. The boys were of course confused, but they soon followed. Two months later, on the final day before the summer holidays, Mr. Yamagami explained what their summer homework was as he handed out printouts. And if you spend 20 to 30 minutes a day on maths and Japanese, you'll have them finished within 10 days. That will just leave your composition. Make sure you enjoy your summer holidays to the fullest extent. After his explanation, the teacher's face screwed up and he bent over, holding his stomach. Sir, what's wrong? Are you sick? Several girls stood up and approached him. Um, my stomach is... Mr. Yamagami painfully stood up and forced a smile. I didn't have any time to go to the toilet this morning, he said and left the room. A couple of boys then followed him to see if he was alright. All of the school toilets had faint blue tiles, so they looked just like a hotel. I'm sorry, Mr. Yamagami said, turning around to the boys before entering the toilets right in front of him. At first they could hear him grunting, but then the noise soon stopped. Five minutes passed. Ten minutes passed. But still, there was no sound. Sir? Twenty minutes had passed since he had entered the toilets. Mr. Yamagami? Mr. Yamagami, are you okay? They knocked on the door, but there was no response. Sir? The air in the toilets was chilly, even though it was summer. The children suddenly grew scared. What should we do? They looked at each other, turned, and all fled from the toilets at once, running back to the classroom. Something bad's happened. Mr. Yamagami won't come out of the toilets. The children went into a frenzy. Really? Did he pass out? Let's go see. Children filed out of the classroom one after the other. Hey, no running in the halls. The teacher from the next class stepped out, 
and grabbed one of the boys. Mr. Yamagami is in the toilet. Eh? Really? After hearing what was going on, the teacher rushed into the toilets. Mr. Yamagami! Mr. Yamagami! Are you in here? She tried to open the door, but it was locked. Somebody go and get a screwdriver from the janitor's room. The children ran off to the janitor's room. The janitor quickly returned with them. Teachers from other classes also ran over. Then, as they finally got the door open, ah! the children all screamed at once. Nobody was inside. Yet, Mr. Yamagami's card holder sat in the toilet bowl, covered in water. After that, nobody saw Mr. Yamagami again. They later discovered that the toilets up on Mount Mitsumine were where the princess killed herself, and the toilets in the school on the outskirts of the castle town was where the princess used to live. Nobody knew where the rumours came from, but they soon spread anyway. Mr Yamagami had visited the castle remains numerous times, so perhaps the spirit of the princess possessed him and dragged him to the other side. The Enthusiastic Principal by Watanabe Setsuko Yamashita-kun was a member of the rugby team at the high school attached to T University. It was a Sunday, and yet he set out for school anyway. The national championships were coming up, so they had to practice every day without fail. His school was strong both academically and at various sports. Their previous principal had been extremely enthusiastic, and he'd even been an Olympic athlete when he was younger. The rugby team was especially famous, and they were always one of the top teams. That was why they put their all into training, and the sun was setting by the time they were done. It took Yamashita-kun longer than he thought putting everything away, and by the time he reached the school gates, everyone else had already gone home. As he took a single step through the school gate, he heard a voice call out to him. Hello. Huh? He thought, and looked around, noticing a man standing right next to him. He was neither slim nor fat, a regular old man you might see anywhere, and he smiled upon seeing Yamashita-kun. He wondered where this man suddenly appeared from. It was dark, sure, but he hadn't seen anyone else around. And on top of that, who was this person? He felt like he'd seen him somewhere before, but… With a strange look on his face, he walked alongside Yamashita-kun, as though he didn't have a care in the world, chatting with him. Sure must be tough training on your day off. The national championships are soon. The opposing team looks strong, huh? That's right. Our school is famous, so you must do your best. Long ago, when I took part in the Olympics, Yamashita-kun suddenly remembered. That was right. He looked just like the principal. Their principal had died suddenly six months earlier. The moment he remembered, the man next to him wavered, and then suddenly disappeared. Yamashita-kun ran off at the speed of light and couldn't recall what happened after that. Next thing he knew, he was surprised to find himself at his own front door. Rumour had it that their enthusiastic principal had stayed late into the night at school. And as he took a single step through the school gate on his way to leave, he suddenly had a heart attack and died on the spot. Spirit at the Graduation Ceremony I was working as a teacher at a small school in Tohoku at the time. It was the summer holidays. One of the students from my sixth grade class, Satoru, drowned at the beach in a tragic accident. He was a lone child, so his parents were grief-stricken. 
It was still only the summer holidays, yet they had already bought his junior high bag, hat, and uniform. I expressed my condolences to them, yet all they could do was cry. I could do nothing for them. The second semester passed, and as we entered the third, graduation approached. One day, Satoru's mother came to visit the school. She placed her hands on her knees and lowered her head. Mrs. Matsutani, please. Satoru came this far, studying with all his friends. Please let him graduate with them. Please prepare a graduation certificate for him too. Tears rolled down my cheeks. I understand, but I can't give you a response until I talk to the principal first. I'll do my best to persuade him as well. That day, the principal was out on business. First thing the next morning, I relayed to him Satoru's mother's request. I also informed him that I too wished to prepare a graduation certificate for him. Still, the principal was not convinced. He's dead, so he doesn't need a certificate. He said bluntly. I gave up. I wanted to scream that he shouldn't say such cold things, but I calmed myself and said, That is exactly why we should give him one. How happy would that make him on the other side? Yet he immediately refused and wouldn't listen to me. No matter how much I begged, he would only say no. Then at the very least, we should display his photo, I said in the end. The principal finally gave in. Finally, it was graduation day. Satoru's friends sat down with his photo. Then, just before 9am, as the ceremony was to begin, the noisy children fell silent and sat up straight in their chairs. And as silence fell, it happened. Something banged nearby, and some wooden panelling in the hall fell down. It's a common sight, right? The planks along the bottom of the wall coming off. One of them fell to the ground. A gust blew in, right by the children holding Satoru's photo. Then one of the guests from the nearby temple said, Oh, Satoru's here. He said nobody invited him, so he came by himself. Everyone fell silent. He was there now. I looked at the principal before I could stop myself. His face turned pale. After the ceremony, I visited Satoru's house with his photo. I told his mother what happened just before 9am, when the ceremony was to begin. So... Satoru, his mother gulped. I sat before his altar and put down his junior high bag and uniform and thought, ah, it's nine, the ceremony is about to begin. Then the front door suddenly opened. Someone must be here, I thought. But nobody was there. The door was open just a bit, only ten centimeters or so. I went outside, but... There was nobody there either. I thought it was strange. Tears rolled down his mother's cheeks. So he went to school. He set out for his graduation ceremony. I was so sad that I couldn't stop the tears from flowing either. Just how badly did he want his graduation certificate? That principal. Even if Satoru was dead, he still had a soul. Why couldn't he see that? I cried alongside Satoru's mother. The lamp burns brightly on the fourth. We attended the village's branch school until the second grade. In the third grade, we moved to the head school. That branch school was left abandoned because over the years, the number of children going there decreased. And then, it was merged with the main school. The empty building was then used as a public hall, but that only lasted three years. A new public hall was built, and this one was left empty. 
The elderly gathered every now and then to open the windows and air the building out, but over time, the building was forgotten. The building rapidly aged as people stopped using it, and the toilet doors flapped in the breeze. Still, everyone was busy trying to make ends meet, so nobody cared. Even those who moved to the big city and wanted the school building to remain because of their nostalgia soon forgot about it. Around the beginning of July, it rained one evening and it was a terribly humid night. I was out late at the apple orchard. On the way back, I passed by the front of the branch school building. A terrible chill ran down my spine. A small light shone through the old closed curtains of one of the classrooms. I figured someone was using the classroom, but it was too dark for that. It was about as bright as an old miniature lamp. Something banged, as though it had been knocked over in the wind. I hit the car horn loudly without thinking. The tiny light suddenly disappeared, and everything went dark. I sped out of there, as though something was on my tail. I wanted to know what was going on, but people would just laugh at me if I mentioned it, so I decided to forget all about it. Three months passed after that incident. Strange rumours began to spread. Hey, did you hear? On the fourth of every month, a light turns on in the old branch school. Apparently, three young kids didn't believe it and went to check it out. And when they got there, the light suddenly went out. And nobody was there. Apparently, the toilet doors were blowing open and shut and a sad voice called out saying, Tomorrow. Some people laughed at how stupid it was. Come to think of it, I'd been at the orchid on the 4th too. I didn't tell anyone I'd also seen it. But a chill ran down my spine, and I was frightened. If you abandon a school, it gets sad too. How about it? We should use it for something. There are city folk who say they want to live in the mountains, so why don't we let them live there? We can let them stay there for real cheap. That should do it. People got to talking, and the town office decided that it would look for people to rent the old building. As the strange rumours continued to spread, nobody wanted to live there. And so, the elderly once again took to opening the doors to air the place out drinking some tea whilst there, etc. As a result, the strange rumours died down as well. Winter passed, and as April began, it was time for our first class reunion in ten years. We visited a hot spring inn in the next town over, and spent the entire night chatting. In the past, we visited the old branch school with some home-cooked food, but as we got older, our reunions got more luxurious as well. The night out began. There were 28 of us old second graders, and the manager was worried about how many would show up. Eight people from the city, and nine living in the village agreed to come, so the attendance rate was quite good. Us 53-year-olds set out to remember our times in the second grade. Everyone drank and chatted. I hope Mr. Komatsu Nobuo is doing well. He's the one teacher I wanted to meet, someone said. He was a great teacher, huh? Everyone sighed. We only had Mr. Komatsu as a teacher during the second grade, from April to March. In July of 1944, he was called to war, where he then died in battle. I want to stay in this school with everyone forever, until you all become fathers and mothers and we can teach your kids here too," Yusuke said in Mr. Komatsu's tone of voice. You sound just like him. He always said stuff like that, huh? Everyone cried as they clapped. The fairy tales Mr. Komatsu used to tell us were the best. I can tell the story of Heppuri Yomego too, Kazuya said, standing up and going outside. 
Mr. Komatsu always stood up and left the classroom once the lesson had ended, even if he was going to tell us a story, heading out into the hall and then returning fresh to start his tale. Everyone started clapping before they could stop themselves. Kazuya entered the room as though he were Mr. Komatsu. The 16, 53-year-olds in the room clapped as though we were all second graders again. Once upon a time, a young woman, embarrassed, complained that she needed to pass wind. She could hold it no longer. She stuck her backside out and let one rip. It was a story we'd heard daily. Kazuya told the story perfectly, even matching Mr. Komatsu's expressions. Next, Mitsuko stood up. Well then, I'll do san no dan no kuku. I'll even draw some pictures to go with it. Mr. Komatsu always put a lot of power behind the word tomorrow. He knew at some point he would be called to war, which is why I think he said it like that. Being able to know his plans for the very next day made him so happy, Mitsuko said fondly. Come to think of it, the last thing he said to us before he left was, grow big and strong and always keep tomorrow close to your heart, didn't he? Fumie said. Tomorrow, huh? I remembered the voice I'd heard in the branch school. When did Mr. Komatsu leave for the war again? I asked everyone. July 4th. It was raining that day. Fumie answered without hesitation. Hey! The ghost in this school! It's Mr. Komatsu! I declared. What day is it today? It's April 4th! Let's go see him! I don't care if he's a monster or a ghost, I want to see him! We borrowed a minibus from the lodgings, and Fumie, who hadn't been drinking, drove us all over. By car, it wouldn't even take 15 minutes to reach the branch school. We got out just before the school. We dropped by the leader of the elderly association's house nearby and borrowed the school key. The sky was moonless and dark. We approached the building stealthily. The lights are on! A light was on in the classroom. We all huddled together before we could stop ourselves and held our breath. It seemed like someone was moving around in there. The faded yellow curtain blew in the wind. We approached the window, still huddled together. Tomorrow. Tomorrow. We could almost hear his voice. Mr. Komatsu! We all called out at once. At that very moment, the light disappeared. We came to see you, sir! Yusuke took the lead and unlocked the classroom. It was empty. We all sat down at the desks, and then we put our hands together for a moment of silence. How old was Mr. Komatsu when he left? He'd just finished university, so 21 or 22. About the same age as my son now. Yusuke rubbed his eyes. In the end, we went back to the lodging, but nobody could sleep. The following day, we all went to visit Mr. Komatsu's grave in the next village over, and then went our separate ways. Before long, an artist from Tokyo rented the empty branch school building and livened the place up. Fumie from the class reunion was the one who found him. She was a chatty person, so she told him about the lights that appear on the fourth of each month, and about how you can hear Mr. Komatsu's voice. Apparently, he said that if he was that nice of a teacher, it would be a pleasure to live with him, even as a ghost. Apparently the artist had also lost his parents in the Tokyo bombings and was left all alone. Now the lights are on in the old building every night, and children drop by to learn how to draw. The artist seems to be rather upset that 
He apparently hasn't seen Mr. Komatsu even once yet, however. I can hear a knock. This happened at a certain elementary school. Now it's a building made of steel and concrete, but back then it was made of wood. No running in the halls. Although the rule was plastered for all to see, you can't stop children from running around. And when they did, the floorboards creaked. The stairs especially creaked with each step taken. One autumn afternoon, the children were taking part in club activities after school and were the only ones left scattered around the building. The children in the soccer club ran around the school oval, screaming and kicking the ball. Yet even this noise calmed down as dark shadows fell over the school grounds. At this time, the fifth graders Tetsuo, Shuji and Akimitsu were still in the second floor library. They were supposed to be putting the labels in order, yet they were absorbed in conversation. Other than the teachers, it felt like they were the only ones in the quiet school, and they enjoyed feeling like they had stepped into another world. Yet suddenly, the door opened, and a teacher stuck their face in. Enough already. Go home. Yes, we'll be finished shortly, the three of them said in unison. The sound of slippers echoed down the hall, and once the teacher was gone, they went back to their conversation. Suddenly, Tetsuo started acting strange. Yeah, true, he answered vaguely, standing up and then sitting down and thrashing his legs about. What are you doing? Shuji asked. Well, my stomach keeps grumbling, Tetsuo said, and put a hand over his stomach. Akimitsu approached him and placed an ear over Tetsuo's stomach. It really is making noise. Does it hurt? Do you want me to go get a teacher? It's fine. Uh, it'll get better if I go to the toilet, he said and reluctantly stood up. You should go quickly. We'll wait here for you. Tetsuo hurried off at Shuji's urging. Still, he turned around and then said, I wanted to do it at home. The school toilets are dirty. I hate them, so I was trying to hold it in. Tetsuo started running as soon as he reached the hall. He felt like if he didn't, he wouldn't make it in time. He leapt down the stairs, and they creaked beneath his feet. The stairs took him to the north end of the school. A short hall led to the building with the toilets, with the boys on the right and the girls on the left. The boys' toilets had a concrete floor with draining boards, several urinals for the boys to use, and roughly six stalls in the back. Tetsuo rushed over and stood before the doors. Even at this time, Tetsuo unconsciously knocked on the door, as his teacher had warned him to. Knock knock. Is anyone inside? He asked. He realised he didn't have to knock this late in the day. Everyone had already gone home. But it seemed that somebody was still there. Knock knock. Someone on the inside knocked back. Tetsuo panicked and rushed to the next door, knocking again, just in case. Knock knock. Once again, a knock immediately returned from the inside. Tetsuo moved to the next door, thinking how unlucky he was. Knock knock. He knocked and went to open the door, and again a knock returned from the inside. Tetsuo panicked and almost wet himself. The next door was the same. He marched on the spot and moved to the sixth door. Knock knock. He knocked and in the quiet toilets he heard the sound echo again. Knock knock. Someone was inside. Were they really all full? I don't care who, but someone hurry up and leave, Tetsuo screamed. Then he heard a sound from inside the sixth door. Uh... 
it sounded like someone's strained groan. At that same moment, it felt like a cold breeze blew throughout the toilets. The door trembled and rattled. Then the toilets fell silent again, and he didn't hear another noise. It was strange. Tetsuo ran straight back to the first door, grabbed the handle, and pulled. It was empty. A chill ran down his spine, and Tetsuo opened all the doors one after the other. Then he opened the sixth and final door. There was nobody inside. His legs trembled. Someone had knocked from inside the toilets. That was real. But who? Who? He screamed and ran all the way back to the library. He forgot all about the pain in his stomach. He could barely speak. Your face is pale. Should we tell a teacher? Shuji panicked. That's not it. Gasping for breath, Tetsuo told them all about the knocks from the empty toilet stalls. We should have a teacher take a look, Akimitsu said. They took different stairs so they didn't have to pass the north toilets and told a teacher what happened. If true, that's a problem, the teacher said with a grin. The teacher went first and they followed him to the toilets. The teacher went in alone and knocked on the toilet doors, pressing an ear to them and then turning around to face the boys. I couldn't hear anything, he said after checking all six. Looks like Tetsuo is the only one who heard anything, he laughed. He no doubt thought Tetsuo imagined it. But sir, I left all the doors open when I ran. Yet when you went in, they were all closed. That's true, they were closed. So I really did hear the knocks. All the colour drained from Tetsuo's face. After that, they rarely saw children in the building after school was done for the day. Tetsuo and his friends graduated, and then the school and toilets were renovated. The school looked nothing like it used to. Yet still, the story of hearing knocks from inside the toilets is still passed down, even now. Hanako-san, Taro-san, Yamiko-san. School toilets are creepy. Our South Elementary School is brand new and so the toilets are too. But I still can't go there alone. Will someone go to the toilets with me? Ah, I'll go. I was waiting for someone to ask. I'll go too then. A bunch of us went over together. During homeroom, one of the boys said, Why do the girls always go to the toilets together and make so much noise? Us girls all turned to look at each other. They always did this, yet Yoshiko-chan couldn't stay quiet any longer. You boys always go together too, don't you? Who are you to talk? That's right, that's right. The girls all agreed at once. They were so noisy that nobody could hear the chairman asking for quiet. In the end, it was decided that people could no longer ask others to join them when going to the toilet. Everyone agreed, but only because they wanted to go home quickly. School toilets really are creepy. After music club was finished for the day, we were putting away the drums and cymbals when Yoshiko-chan ran into the room, her face pale. Guys, the third toilet door won't open. It's really strange. I knocked, but there was no answer. Maybe someone didn't feel well and passed out inside. Eh? The third toilet? Maki-chan screamed. So, she's finally appeared at our school too. Who? Well, there's a girl who appears in the toilets of North Elementary School, called Hanako-san. She's a ghost. A first grade girl went in and disappeared. Yoshiko-chan, you're lucky you didn't go into the third toilet. 
Yoshiko-chan was the strongest girl in the class, but even she trembled at that, and the other girls started screaming and crying. At North Elementary, if you want to enter the third stall, you have to knock five times and call out Hanako-san three times. If you don't do that, the door won't open. If you force your way in, you'll be cursed. What type of curse? You'll be paralyzed or you'll be spirited away like the first grade girl. After that, we were too scared to even pass in front of the toilets. And when we had to go to the science room, we'd take the long way around up on the second floor. Everyone was talking about Hanako-san, even the other classes. Before long, people started talking about the ghost of Taro-kun, who appeared in the boys' toilets. Sounds fake to me. Hanako-san appears in the girls' toilets, so it sounds like they're trying to start some kind of competition. Shh! If it's true, the ghost will hear and attack you. Don't come crying to me if you get cursed. The boys seemed to enjoy the rumours, and whenever they entered the toilets, they'd say, Taro-san! Taro-san! Yes? Someone would then answer. Apparently there was a hazy figure that would then disappear, but that wasn't all. Before long, a young female ghost by the name of Yamiko-san appeared too. I ran into her when I went to the toilets the other day. A woman came in holding a baby. I'm sorry, could you hold her for me? She said, handing me the baby and closing the door. I thought she had to be a mother watching an open day lesson so I took the baby. The baby was chubby and cute. I loved babies, so I fawned over her. There, there, who's a good girl? Yet the baby started to get heavier and heavier. My hands hurt. I wanted to give the baby back, fearing I couldn't hold her up alone any longer. But the woman wouldn't come out. Come on, come on. This was why I didn't want to go to the toilet alone. Class was about to start. Come on, come on. Please come out by the time I count to ten. One, two, three, four. I started counting in a loud voice. The baby got heavier and heavier with each number. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. When I finished counting to ten, the baby was too heavy to hold. I put the baby down and ran. That... that has to be Yamiko-chan, Maki-chan said. Eh? The baby got heavier and heavier. Yeah. Did the woman count inside the toilet? If it was Yamiko-san, she would have. No, only I did. No way! Oh, how scary. And nothing happened. You've got to be cursed now. Huh? What should I do? I clung to Maki-chan. I'm not cursed or anything now, but school toilets sure are creepy. Red paper. Blue paper. Colter started the third grade. As he did, his classroom moved to the second floor. The students also changed, and he made new friends. I'm a big boy now, he thought. But there was one thing that bothered him. There was a rumour that a ghost appeared in the toilets that the third and fourth graders used. Colter didn't like ghosts. Still, on the first day of third grade, he needed to use the toilet when it was time to go home. He was embarrassed, but he asked his good friend Yakkun about it. Have you ever gone number two in the second floor toilets? No. Why? Um, don't laugh, okay? Just say it. You're talking about the ghost, right? Having said that, Yakkun did laugh at him. Then he whispered, Honestly, I was scared too. When I asked my older brother about it, he said there were no ghosts there. So it's fine. Don't worry. 
relieved, Kolta went to the toilet. But he was surprised when he entered. There was something written on the wall in front of him. Don't look up. If you do, you'll be killed. There was a red arrow pointing up with it. Kolta forgot all about using the toilet, speeding out of there as fast as he could and running towards home. But he couldn't hold it in any longer, and so he stopped by the kindergarten he used to go to. Can I please use your toilet? He asked in a loud voice. As he left the toilet, the director grinned at him. Lucky you made it in time, huh? They would have laughed at you if you wet yourself. Ho ho ho! I'll never use this toilet again. I'm a big boy now, Coulter decided. As he walked into his classroom the next morning, everyone was talking about the ghost in the toilets. Yakun, are you guys talking about that writing on the wall? Even if it was just graffiti, it was still scary. But Yakun shook his head. The teacher already cleaned that off. This is even scarier than that. No matter how many times they put toilet paper in there, it keeps disappearing. Eh? I didn't have time to see that. Yakkun continued in a quiet voice. And then, if someone's inside, they'll hear a voice asking, Do you want paper? Would you like red paper or blue paper? If you say red, a red hand will pop up out of the toilet, waving some red paper. If you say blue, a blue hand will pop up, waving blue paper. Colter got chills and covered his ears before he realised what he was doing. Did someone see it? I don't know, but the older kids said it happens on the third floor toilets too. No way! And you're okay with that? No, but the older kids said that if a red or blue hand appears, they just pull on it. So it's fine. Then Yakkun spoke in a low voice again. You gotta keep this a secret from the first and second graders. They're only small, so they'll get scared. I'm scared. Uh, that's fine. I just won't use the toilet at school, Kota decided. But when it was time to go home again, he really needed to use the toilet. He'd made his decision, but he really, really needed to go. Oh yeah, I can use the toilets on the first floor. He rushed down to the first floor, finished his business, and rushed out of the toilets. As he was washing his hands, a small child laughed at him. Once again, Coulter decided to never, ever use the toilets at school again. Yet the next day, when it was time to go home, he needed to use the toilet again. He'd already gone that morning, so he figured he wouldn't have to go again, but he still felt the urge. If he asked his friends to come along, they'd bang on the door and mess around, although he didn't think anyone would open it. Of course, Kota would never do such a thing either. He couldn't say anything to Yakkun, but he didn't think he could hold out until he got home either. All right, let's do this. If a ghost shows up, I'll beat him up. I'm a third grader now. Kota banged on the door closest to the entrance, terrified. There was no answer. He flung the door open. There was toilet paper inside. He finished his business. Jeez, nothing happened at all. There really was no ghost after all. Coulter sighed in relief. He didn't need to use the toilets at school for a while after that. He laughed when people sometimes talked about the ghost in the toilet. But then one day, Coulter needed to go again, so he ran to the toilets. He sighed when he was done. But there's no toilet paper. At that moment, a thin, trembling voice echoed in the toilets. Do you want red paper 
Or do you want blue paper? A city sits on the outskirts of Tokyo, a 20-minute train ride from Shinjuku. 20 years have passed since then, but this story happened when I was in the fourth grade of elementary school. Rumours suddenly started to spread of something called the purple granny that appeared in the school toilets. If she appeared, you had to grab something purple, it didn't matter what, and she would then disappear if you said, purple, purple. I was a scaredy cat, so I tried to convince myself, there's no such thing as monsters. It was a cold day and rain drizzled outside. I was in the toilet after school, and the light above flickered on and off, almost broken, and buzzed loudly. A bad feeling washed over me. Then the lights suddenly went out. The toilets went dark, and the air felt cold. <gasps> What's going on? Please? The lights! Turn them on! Quickly! I looked up at the large hole above the toilet, which had been covered with a poster. A strange sound came from it, and then a sinewy hand popped out. Gah! I fell backwards, and a pale old woman in a purple kimono suddenly jumped down in front of me. It happened in an instant. She grinned, and our eyes locked on each other. I screamed before I could stop myself. Sh sh she's here! The purple granny! I was scared stiff. As I desperately tried to open the toilet door, I touched a purple charm hanging around my neck. My grandpa got it from Hachiman Sama, and he told me, make sure you always wear it, okay? Oh, thank goodness, I'm saved. It's purple. I gripped the charm, losing myself in it, and mustering my voice shouted, purple, purple. The purple granny disappeared in that very same moment. I managed to crawl out of the toilet and, as I stopped to catch my breath, I turned around and realised that my shadow was purple. Yeah! What's going on? What the heck? I didn't know what else would happen to me if I stung, stuck around in the school any longer. Dragging my trembling legs behind me, I ran all the way home. The moment I saw my grandfather's face, I collapsed at the front door. He panicked and brought me some water. After that, I went to the toilet and, phew, how relieved I was. After I calmed down, I told my grandpa about what happened. Long ago, there was a poor girl. No matter how much her family worked, they remained poor, and all the little girl had was a single, worn out kimono. Eh? She didn't have any other clothes? That's right. In the past, poor people always wore the same clothes. Anyway, listen. The landowner at the time, his daughter, wore western style clothes. She had some clothes with a purple cape that the little girl wanted to try on just once. That girl was envious of her. One windy day, the purple cape blew away and the girl picked it up. She went to put it on her shoulders just for a moment, yet the landowner's daughter realised it was missing right away and screamed at the little girl, Thief! That's so mean. She didn't mean to steal it, did she? No, she didn't. And after that, people thought of her as a thief. She grew up without a single moment of happiness, and then passed away a lonely old woman. It's said that the school toilets were built behind where her house used to be. Because I gripped the purple charm and said, purple, purple, the purple granny's resentment disappeared. I don't know whether she was able to move on or not though. But after that day, not a single person saw her again. And on that note, are you sure that 
Your school toilets are safe as well? This is the story about an elementary school that was built on a former execution site. One day, a strange rumour started to spread. They say there's a dodgeball in the girls' toilets. The school toilets weren't yet flush toilets at the time. Each toilet was separate, but they all connected in the same place. It's not a very pleasant story, but students feared that they might fall in. And of course, if a dodgeball was in those toilets, you would definitely see it. Had someone carelessly dropped it in there? But who on earth would go into the toilets carelessly holding a ball that big? At any rate, the story captivated the children. Rumours beget more rumours, and the curious girls apparently went to check it out for themselves. There it is! It's really there! I can see something round in there. No way. I went too, but I didn't see anything. The girls went into an uproar. Yet, some girls could see it, while others couldn't. It was quite strange. One rainy day, there was a mischievous girl who had yet to see the ball for herself. It was raining, so she was bored and couldn't play outside. After class ended and it was time to go home, she remembered the story of the ball. She didn't need to go to the toilet, but she stopped by anyway. It was awfully quiet compared to lunchtime. I shouldn't have come here by myself. I should go, she thought. But she succumbed to her curiosity. She opened the closest door and looked into the toilet. It was the same as always. She could see murky water, but not much else. She checked the second, and then the third toilets as well. Jeez, there's nothing here. How boring. Disappointed, she went into the fourth stall and looked down. Then, she saw it. Finally. Somewhat moved, she stared into the filth. But, is it really a dodgeball? It looks bigger than that. At that very moment, the thing seemed to move. Yeah! It moved again. It seemed to sink down into the water, then pop back up again. Yeah! The girl ran out of the toilets. It had definitely moved, but she couldn't believe her own eyes. Once she calmed down, she gently opened the toilet door again. As she did, a bluish-black boy's head popped out of the toilet and glared at her. She slammed the door shut and ran all the way to the teacher's room. The rumours of the dodgeball changed into rumours of an owl bozu that lingered for a long, long time. Time. Numerous children claimed the owl bozu had glared at them as well, so much so that, for a while, a teacher had to accompany them whenever they went to the toilets. Finally, when the school switched to flush toilets, rumours of the owl bozu disappeared. White Hand, Red Hand one day, the fifth grader Mitsuko went to the toilet, but then she never returned. Class started, but still. The students started chatting noisily, and the teacher was nervous as well. Do you know which toilets Mitsuko-san went to? The teacher asked, but nobody knew. Then everyone in the class suggested that they go find her. You guys go and check the east toilets on the first floor. You go and check the second floor. Make sure you knock on the door first. If there's no response, then try opening it. If there is, then you should know Mitsuko's voice. I don't think she'll be in the boys' toilets, but I want you to check them as well, please. Okay, got it! The children split up into groups and searched the first and second floor toilets. 
knock 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 creak bang miss she wasn't where i checked the report came back but then someone from the north toilet said miss there was only one stall that didn't reply but we couldn't get the door open that's the only place we're not sure of in the whole school there was only one stall that they couldn't confirm was empty or not the teacher and students went to check it together knock knock there was no reply and the door wouldn't open someone go and call the janitor the janitor arrived and broke open the door ah huh? mitsuko mitsuko was lying unconscious on the floor her face blue the teacher looked more terrified than the children had ever seen before everyone return to the classroom and do some self study she said picking mitsuko up in a panic and running to the nurse's office a short while later and after gathering all the information together this is what went down she was taken to the nurse's office and given some smelling salts mitsuko finally woke up but all she would say was white hand red hand they called her mother who then came to the school and by that time she had finally calmed down her mother took her home and asked her about what happened mitsuko said she went to the toilet and when she was finished and about to wipe something cold touched her backside surprised she looked down and saw a white hand and a red hand reaching for her bottom she screamed and then passed out when she came back to she was on a bed in the nurse's office what would have happened to her if her friends and teacher hadn't come to save her after that it was decided the students would no longer use that particular toilet this happened to kazuo-kun when he was a junior high student When he was in the first grade, he went to the toilets in the north side of the school that had just been built. He opened the door as he was about to leave and suddenly he heard a voice calling out to him from behind. "Hey." "Huh?" Panicking, he turned around and the door slammed shut behind him. There was nobody else around. Of course not. He was in a single toilet stall. I'm so stupid, he muttered to himself. But when he went to open the door again, it felt rather heavy. That's strange. It wasn't like this before, he thought and pushed harder. Hey. Hey. He let go before he could stop himself and the door slammed shut again. He nervously looked around, but he couldn't see anything out of the ordinary. There wasn't even any graffiti or holes in the walls. It was newly built after all. Maybe someone was peeking at him from above. He looked up at the ceiling, but there was nothing strange there either. I must be imagining things, but I really did hear it so clearly. Oh well, best to get out of here. He grabbed the door, but it was unbelievably heavy. It was even heavier than before, like someone was leaning against it from the other side. He pushed against it with all his might, and when it finally opened, he clearly heard a voice. "Hey, are you just going to leave me here?" The voice was low, but he clearly heard it. His heart felt like it was going to implode, and Kazuo-kun squeezed his eyes shut. but there was no further sound after that and finally he opened his eyes the moment he let go of the door it closed there really was nobody else around but at about eye level on the wall in front of him there was a red dot about the size of a thumb it looked red like blood eh huh? was this here before He pressed his face closer to the wall to look at it. But then suddenly, that red stain suddenly spread out, expanding to roughly the size of his palm. 
This round shape expanded in front of him, forming eyes, a nose, and a mouth. It turned into a human face, and then from its neck it and then from its neck it expanded downwards, turning into a boy with arms and legs. This dark red bloody boy reached out with both hands for Kazuo-kun's face and said, "Take me with you." Surprised, Kazuo-kun fell backwards into the wall and then passed out. Something is whistling, he thought, and when he opened his eyes, he was lying in a graveyard. He was lying in front of an unnamed grave behind the school. He had no idea how he got there. Not to mention, there was a large fence separating the school from the graveyard. Plus, there wasn't a single friend who saw him leave the toilets either. Apparently, the unnamed grave was that of a person who was killed. They moved the graves to build the new school building, but apparently, where the toilets now stood had once been where those graves were. I visited my old junior high school for the first time in 7 years. I had to work as a student teacher for 2 weeks in order to earn my teaching certification. But to be honest, I didn't really want to go there. I wanted to work at some other school, but they were all full with their own graduated students, and so they turned me away. And if I didn't get this teaching experience, then I wouldn't get the credits I needed. And so I had no choice but to do it at my former junior high. This weighed on me as I walked through the front gates. The stains on the walls, the graffiti on the desks, the long halls, all of it was the same as 7 years prior. Not a single thing had changed. It didn't make me feel nostalgic. Rather, it shocked me. When I was done meeting everyone in the staff room, I made my way towards the gym so I could greet the students at the morning assembly. And beside that gym was that toilet. I started slowly walking down the hall. For a long time, I had tried to forget that hall, but the memories of what happened that terrible summer night we slept at the school for a training camp came back to me once more. That was the night of our first camp for the drama club. I woke up during the night because I needed to go to the toilet. I looked at the clock and it said midnight. Our school didn't have facilities for training camps, and so we were sleeping in the same gym that we were using for practice during the day. In order to reach the toilet, I had to pass through the wide open gym and go over to beside the entrance. Ugh. I was a massive scaredy cat. And on top of that, there was a strange rumor at our school. Apparently, there used to be a large mansion owned by a warrior on the land our school now stood on, and it was said that that warrior went crazy and killed several of his own servants. He then secretly buried the bodies, and those graves were beneath where the gym toilets now stood. People said they had seen Hitodama in the toilets at night and some teacher had died a strange death as well. There were all sorts of unpleasant rumors. I remembered these in the darkness and it made me want to go to the toilet even less. I thought about waking someone up but everyone was fast asleep thanks to the day's practice. I nervously got up and walked over to the toilets as quietly as I could. There was only a small single light bulb in the toilets, so they were still rather dark. I opened the first door with a creak. Before long, I suddenly heard something. Shall I dress you in a red vest? A creepy voice floated in from somewhere. Even after covering my ears, I could still hear it. Shall I dress you in a red vest? A red vest. 
I burst out of the toilet and ran back to the others. Ma-ma-ma'am! There's something in the toilets! I finally forced the words out. I was covered in sweat and my legs trembled. Be quiet! What are you making a fuss over at this time of night? Our club teacher, Miss Yamamoto, said, her voice sounding annoyed. There was something in the toilet! What? A, a strange voice. When I went to the toilet, it said, Shall I dress you in a red vest? And I was so scared. It was no doubt just someone playing a joke. She counted all the sleeping students. Everyone was there. Looks like everyone is here. I'm telling the truth. There really was something in the toilets. I was about to cry. This caused everyone to wake up, and so it was decided that we would all check out the toilets together. First, we flung open the door to the first stall I had entered. But there was nothing strange about it. Then, one by one, we opened all 13 doors. But there was nobody inside, and there was no strange voice either. In the end, everyone agreed that I, a scaredy cat, must have just been hearing things. There's nobody here. You're always causing trouble like this. They all treated me like I was stupid. It's scary because you think it will be scary. Next time you hear a voice asking to dress you in a red vest in the toilet, tell it to try. Gosh, don't wake everyone up over something as trivial as this. Miss Yamamoto got angry at me. Everyone went back to bed like nothing had happened, but I couldn't get back to sleep. Right as I started to doze off, I heard the sound of somebody's footsteps. I looked at the clock. It was 2am. I could see Miss Yamamoto's back in the dim light. She must be going to the toilet, I thought. I turned over, closed my eyes and then fell asleep. The next morning, Come quickly! It's Miss Yamamoto! We all rushed over to the toilets and found Miss Yamamoto covered in blood. She was dead. The blood covering her happened to look just like a red vest. After that, the toilets were boarded up and forbidden to use. I wonder if she answered the voice in the toilet that night, the same way she had told me to. Try it. Seven years had passed since then. What was I so nervous about? I was just about to reach the gym. Ugh. Suddenly my stomach started to hurt. Things started to get dark. I rushed into the toilets. It was then that I realized something. I was in the very first stall. Roughly 50 years ago, Japan was at war with China and the US. Gradually, Japan's defeat came into sight. The Americans dropped a bomb on one of our large cities, causing factories, houses, and so on to be burnt and destroyed. And so, in order to evacuate schoolchildren to safety, their teachers took them to a safer location. Shizue and her fellow fourth graders from Tokyo were also evacuated to a temple in Tea Village, Yamagata Prefecture. It was so sudden that the villagers were in disarray. Even just walking around the village to collect bedding for the children was terribly difficult. There weren't enough washrooms for the children to even wash their faces, so they had to clean themselves in the small river at the bottom of the temple. A hastily built toilet was also assembled for them in the bamboo grove by the temple. Even without wind, the bamboo swayed. Simply walking through the bamboo caused it to rustle, and in the darkness, it was quite creepy. At night time, it was so terrifying that the children couldn't walk through it alone. That was why Shizue decided she would go with her friend, Fumiko. 
Kimiko was a kind child. However, she was a tiny girl and nothing but skin and bones, so she often succumbed to stomach aches and colds. And so the boys would often tease her, calling out, Hey, you spoilt bean sprout, tread carefully. Every time they did, Fumiko cried. The evacuated children were always hungry. They only received staples, such as rice porridge and flour dumplings, so their hunger was never sated. And so, some of the girls asked their parents in Tokyo to send them a small beanbag ball. Inside that, they would put rice and soybeans that had been soaked in soy sauce. The teachers would confiscate any food, but because the beanbag was a toy, they would hand it straight to the children. When a package arrived from Tokyo and was full of beanbags, the children were overjoyed. They hid and ate the rice and soybeans inside. One night, as autumn approached, Shizue-chan, wake up. I need to go to the toilet. Fumiko woke Shizue up. They held hands and entered the bamboo grove. It swayed side to side and made a creepy noise as it did so. As she stood before the toilet, Fumiko took a small bean bag like a polka dot out of her bag. Here, you can have this. I got it just today. She placed it on Shizue's open palm. Judging by the texture, there were soybeans inside. The moment she entered the toilet, Fumiko screamed. The door flung open as though her scream had forced it, and one of the boys went running. Fumiko then also stepped outside in tears. Give it back! Give my bean bag back! The boy had ambu- ambushed her and stolen it right from her hands. A short time later, Fumiko fell ill with pneumonia and a high fever. A horse drawn carriage took her to the nearest hospital, but the next day, Fumiko passed away. After that, more and more children claimed that they could hear Fumiko's cries coming from the toilet, making them too scared to go. The dorm leader gathered all the children and did their best to convince them that ghosts and monsters weren't real. Yet they were still afraid, and so they decided to visit the toilet together. Shizue went with them. The dorm leader spoke as they all stood before the toilet. See, I can't hear anything. You're all afraid of a mere superstition. Then they opened and closed each of the three doors, one by one. The light bulb above swayed in the air, and it all seemed like nothing but a dream. Yeah, that's right. There's nothing here. The children were convinced and about to return home when... Creak. Bang. One of the toilet doors opened by itself. Give it back. Give me back my bean bag. It was Fumiko's sad voice. The children clung to the dorm leader, who also trembled. They couldn't even speak. And so, a new toilet was built right next to the temple. The head monk held a ceremony for Fumiko, and the toilets in the bamboo grove were destroyed. The toilet with bright red water. These days, most schools hire a company that specializes in security to patrol and prevent crime. Hanada-san worked for one of these companies, and he was stationed at a school in Chiba. Although he had to follow a set course through the school, there was no set time to do this, and he only had to do it three times a night. One night, as he was on his first patrol for the night, he went up to the second floor. He noticed the lights in the girls' toilets at the end of the hall were on. There was no way that any of the female students would be at the school at this hour. Thinking someone must have forgotten to turn the lights off, he walked over just in case. Hello? Anyone here? He called out, but there was no reply. 
Is anyone here? He called out again, but still there was no reply. He was relieved that someone had simply forgotten to turn off the light, so he turned it off himself. But three hours later, as he did his second round for the night, he was dumbfounded. The lights in the girls' toilets at the end of the hall were on again, even though he had definitely turned them off. Something didn't feel right, and without thinking, he clutched the baton by his hip as he approached the toilet. But of course, nobody was there. Just in case, he called out anyway. Is there anyone in here? There was no response. If not, I'm going to turn the lights off. More silence. He couldn't sense anyone inside either. But just as he was about to turn the lights off, he thought he should check inside the stalls, just in case. He started from the first of five doors on the right, knocking on the door. There was no sound inside. He knocked on the second door. Nothing. He opened it, and there was nobody inside. He knocked on the third door and reached for the handle, but then he heard a small noise, like a rattle or a click, coming from inside. Ah, somebody must be in there, he thought, and went to let go, but then the door opened. Inside was empty. However, the moment he sighed in relief, the water in the toilet started to flush. But that water, it was bright red, like blood. Hanada-san fled from the toilets, leaving everything open. On his third round for the night, he couldn't bring himself to go up to the second floor, so he ignored it. Still, he couldn't get the situation out of his head, so as morning came, he went up again to check it out. The lights were off and the door closed. He flushed the toilet, and it was like that red water had never been there to begin with. But even after that, there were times where the lights were suddenly on in the second floor toilets. As long as they were left alone, they would be off in the morning. But if you checked the third stall when the lights were on, then red water would fill the toilet. Nobody knew why, and Nothing ever happened during the day either. But apparently the girls, and the girls alone, knew why. There were rumours of a girl passed out on the ground in the toilets during the summer holidays. Apparently, it was because she lost a lot of blood. I heard you can hear a baby's cries in there. Apparently, someone heard her asking for her baby back. Either way, she definitely had some reason to be hanging around, and they refused to use the toilets during the day as well. Clock Thief There was a school skilled in baseball that sat between the mountains of Hyogo Prefecture. This school always made it to the semi-finals of the prefectural school tournament, and several decades earlier, had even made it to the much-desired Koshien competition. This school was built during the Taisho era, and on the outskirts of the school grounds, there was an old two-story building made of cedar. It was, at present, used by the baseball club for their training camps, but the roof was falling apart, and the walls were a mess of patchwork as well. At night, the only light came from a single naked bulb in the dim entranceway, and the students called the building a haunted house. After the May holidays, the tournament that would decide which schools could attend Koshien approached. The baseball club members stayed in the haunted house for camp, practicing each morning until classes started, and each night until they could no longer see the ball. One day, after sixth period ended, the baseball club members were getting changed into their uniforms in the changing room. Does anyone know what happened to my watch? The Captain Aikun asked casually, looking around at everyone. Your watch? His friend asked, and the Captain nodded his head. I tried to find it when I went to bed last night so I could set an alarm, but I couldn't find it anywhere. 
Come to think of it. Beacon, the team shortstop said as he tilted his head. I also lost the watch I got as a present when I started high school. You too? Beacon nodded and the changing room suddenly fell silent. The captain then asked everyone else. Has anyone else lost their watch? Everyone looked at each other, and two, then three people also put their hands up. And after that, more and more members also found their watches went missing. During class, and during practice. It seemed that a thief was entering the dorm when it was empty. And strangely, the only thing that was ever taken was watches. The dorm was always empty when the baseball club weren't using it. That meant that there was nobody looking after the building when they weren't there. We'll have to make sure someone stays behind at all times. But that means we'll have to leave someone out of training. We don't have any choice. We can't keep ignoring this. The club members spoke to their coach and it was decided they would patrol the dorm in teams of two or three between practice sessions. After that, the thief immediately stopped and no more watches were taken. Finally, the day before the first match of the prefectural tournament arrived, they finished up their final after-school practice in just one hour and then rested. After dinner, the club members held a meeting in the cafeteria to discuss the following day's game. Listen, you have to go to bed early tonight, okay? The coach said, retiring to his room shortly before 10 p.m. Some people went to the shower, some dove straight into bed, and others gathered to secretly keep talking. But once it passed 11 p.m., the lights went off in the dorm one by one. It took just shy of an hour for the last light to finally turn off. Rattle, rattle. Rattle, rattle. The sliding door in the entrance slowly rattled as it opened. Who could it be at this hour? One of the club members who was near the entrance and unable to sleep got out of bed in his pajamas and peered out into the darkness. Oh, that's... He unconsciously held his breath. A tall, thin man wearing a long coat well out of season walked past his room. Who are you? He screamed, jumping out into the hall before he could stop himself. The man seemed to stop for a moment before immediately running for the other end of the dorm. Wait! Panicking, he chased after the man, but the man stomped towards the end of the dorm and up the stairs to the second floor. Th thief! Room by room, the club members woke up to the noise and went to see what all the fuss was about. The coach also emerged from his room holding a wooden sword. W where The second floor! All right, he's on the second floor, guys. Following the coach's lead, the club members went up the stairs to the second floor. A torch! Get a torch! Someone screamed. The second floor was rarely used, so it was covered in dust and there were no light bulbs, making it pitch black. The torchlight shone wildly all over the place. The narrow hall was full of broken chairs and desks and they could vaguely see half-open rooms and broken window glass in the torchlight. But there was no sign of any person. All right, he's got to be in one of the rooms. The rooms were all in a row at the south end of the building. First, they carefully opened the door to the first room. There was a broken wooden bed on each side of the room, but no sign of any person. They went through each of the rooms one by one, but there was no sign of anyone anywhere. And then, finally, they reached the last one. Creak. Creak. The door made a rusty sound as it was opened. But there was nobody inside. The club members looked at each other. He disappeared. The windows on the second floor were nailed shut, meaning there was no way he could have jumped out from there. What about the toilets? 
someone suddenly said. Oh yeah, we haven't checked the toilets yet. The toilet was right at the end of the building. It was a large, old-fashioned toilet with roughly ten urinals installed. In the torchlight, they could see the door half open. The club members followed their coach, holding his wooden sword, as he nervously entered the toilets. The place stank of dust and mould that immediately pierced their nostrils. They shone the circle of torchlight on each toilet door. The toilets were silent, and they couldn't hear a single sound. Open the door, the coach said, pushing one of the club members forward. Creak. First, they opened the first door. In the torchlight, they saw a dark hole and a wooden gold cover. All right, next. They opened the doors one by one, but then the fourth door refused to open. Hey, is someone in there? The coach banged on the door. There was no response, but they could sense somebody inside. Pressing an ear to the door, they could hear an odd noise in there. Hey, get out here. Come out, you can't run anymore. I'll break that door down if you don't come out. The coach and club members screamed, but still there was no response. All right, I'm going to break it down. The coach banged on the door with his wooden sword, and then finally, it opened. Gah! The club members took a step back before they could stop themselves. In the torchlight, they saw a man hanging from a leather band tied to the doorframe. His hands hung limp by his sides, and his white sneakers swayed to and fro. And in the dark hole beneath him, they heard the ticking sound of numerous watches. Tick, tick. Tick, tick. The sound was coming from inside the narrow toilet. And the dead man's body above them seemed to swing in time with the beat. C call the police! They quickly called 110, and the police took the man's body down, and they discovered dozens, no, hundreds, of watches and clocks attached all over the man's body. And every single one of them seemed to tick as though in rhythm with the man's heart. Tick, tick. Tick, tick. They continued ticking. After that, the baseball club's training camps took place in another location. But for some reason, that dorm was not demolished, but instead left empty to rot, standing dark on the school grounds. If you passed by it on rainy evenings, then it was said you could hear a faint ticking, like that of a clock, coming from the second floor. And so, nobody goes near it anymore. The locked toilet. These days it's a university, but this apparently happened back when the school was a commercial high school. There was a toilet in one of the dorms that was boarded shut with nails. Of the five stalls, it was the one at the end. There had to be a reason for it, right? But it had been shut for so long that nobody knew the reason why anymore. One day, a student said, Hey, do you think we might be able to use that toilet? Every morning, the toilets were always packed. People were always trying to use them before class started, so it was always busy. Yeah, if it's broken, we should have them fix it. The other students agreed. And so, they told the school they wanted to use that closed toilet. The school quickly opened it back up. Inside, it was nothing but dust. But there was nothing odd about it. And so, from that day, it was open for use. But that night, one of the students went to use that toilet after dinner, but they returned to their room with a strange look on their face. Hey. That toilet they said we could use today, 
It won't open. Don't be stupid. No doubt somebody was just inside. No, I knocked and knocked, but nobody replied. There was no way. And so they all went over to check. But as they said, the door wouldn't open. Not if they pushed, nor if they pulled. And of course, there didn't appear to be anyone inside either. The next day, the students got the school's permission and broke the door down. That's when they realised the door was locked from the inside. There was no window, and nobody inside, so how could it possibly have been locked? Everyone looked at each other. Two or three days after they destroyed the door, a carpenter put in a new one. But that night, as a student tried to go in, once again, the door wouldn't open. There really must have been a reason they boarded it shut then. The students couldn't stop talking about it. Rumours of the toilet quickly spread throughout the school, and there was one person who was especially happy to hear of it. That was a student from the judo club, who was especially confident in his own strength. That sounds interesting. All right, I'll go check it out, he said. And straight away that night, he locked himself in the toilet. He hid a match and candle in his pocket. One hour, and then two hours passed. Nothing happened. He tried to open the door and it opened perfectly fine. But staying still in the dark, narrow toilet was harder than he thought it would be. Even worse, it wasn't a flush toilet. It stank beneath the dark, open hole. Finally, as the night wore on, everything fell quiet. Students stopped coming to the toilets as well. The judo student was so bored that he let out a big yawn. He looked at his watch, and it was almost 1am. I'm usually asleep at this time, he thought, and suddenly he felt tired. And although he knew he shouldn't, at some point, he fell asleep. How much time passed? A cold breeze blew up from his feet, and the judo student woke up. Everything around him was pitch black. Hmm? A blackout? He took the match and candle out of his pocket, but then, a cold chill traced up from his neck and around his cheek. Ugh. He shrugged before he could stop himself. He touched his cheek, and it was wet. Something was there. Panicking, he lit the candle and then screamed. Both the match and the candle immediately went out. Red blood was on his hand and his cheek. The judo student tried desperately to flee, but the door wouldn't open. At some point, it had locked. He panicked and panicked, but still it wouldn't open. Fearing he was locked in there, he grew even more terrified. Someone open up! Help me! He screamed, barely able to think anymore. He pounded on the door, kicked it, slammed against it with his body like he'd completely lost it. That awful racket woke up the other students. They quickly ran over and pried the door open. The judo student almost crawled out and sat on the floor. B -b blood was all he managed to get out. He held his trembling hand up for all to see, but there was nothing on it. Huh? The judo student turned back to look at the stall he just came out of, and the door was once again closed. And no matter how hard they tried to open it again, it refused to budge. A short while later, rumours began to spread around the dorms. A student once hung themselves in that toilet. And after that, the door to that toilet would consistently refuse to open. Huh, so that's why it was boarded shut. And once again, the students grew fearful of that toilet. Before long, more rumours began to spread. I heard someone pried the door open 
and saw a dead student standing inside. You can hear sounds and somebody crying in that locked toilet. But there was no longer anyone curious enough to enter and find out for themselves. On the contrary, they all avoided it. Let's have them board that toilet shut again, many of the students from the dorm said. And so, the school boarded the toilet shut again. And even now, there's still a toilet in that university that is sealed shut.